So good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, depending wherever you are. Mm, I, I warmly welcome all of you to this 99th uh, special webinar. I'm really happy that uh, the webinar could go so far. And next week, we will be celebrating the 100th webinar, uh, where Professor Stuart Parkin has kindly agreed to give the talk. And today, we have a very special lady, uh, Dr. Sijoni Mollik, uh, whom I know from many years. Uh, I was very fortunate to have her in our group as a PhD student. And now I'm very <clears throat> delighted to see the kind of excellent work she's doing with uh, Professor Manuel Bibes at Thales Lab and many others uh, collaborators I see on the list. So uh, as I said, so Sijoni <clears throat> did her PhD uh, in Nysa Bhubaneswar. Unfortunately, under uh, my supervision, uh, but I don't want to take any credit uh, for her good work. It's all her. Uh, and uh, she has worked um, on organic spintronics uh, during her PhD. I think probably it would not be wrong to say maybe she was the first person to get a PhD in India from organic spintronics, to the best of my knowledge, because we kind of started that field here. Now there are several groups working on organic spintronics and but probably Sijani was the first to, again, to the best of my knowledge. And uh, she finished her PhD in 2019. And then she moved uh, to uh, Paris, uh, to the group of Professor Manuel Bibes at Thales Lab for a postdoc. And since then, she's there and doing excellent work under the uh, supervision of uh, Manuel. And I'm very glad to see her recent papers, Signature Communications, and many other high impact journals. So, uh, uh, I mean, Sijan is working on several things and uh, mostly uh, potassium tantalum based uh, two dimensional electron gases uh, with very high rasba spin orbit coupling and superconductivity. I think this is the topic of today's talk. And uh, she is emerging as a star researcher, a young researcher, uh, but in this short period of time, she has given many invited talks in prestigious conferences like. MRS Spring Meeting 2021 in Boston, then SPICE Orbitronics in 2022 in, in Germany, then uh, Joint European Magnetic Symposium, which was held recently in Poland, DPG Meeting uh, 2022 in Germany, and so on. So I'm very glad uh, to have you, Sijani, uh, on this platform. Uh, and we are all looking forward to your lecture. Uh, just i like to mention that <clears throat> during the lecture, we don't take any questions. Uh, mm -hmm. After the lecture, we'll have the questions. And before that, of course, we have to take a short uh, uh, screenshot of the photos. So I would request all of you to turn on your cameras and we take a quick group photo. And uh, yeah, so again, on behalf of the whole W2S team, I uh, thank you, Sijoni, for joining. And uh, I'm really looking forward to your lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the introduction. And I am really happy to like present my work in this W2S platform. It's also very nice because it's I'm giving the 99th lecture. So just before 100. So I feel really like fortunate to do so. And I hope I can give a nice overview of my recent work, whatever I'm doing. So but just before maybe starting my talk, I would like to like uh, spend uh, a couple of minutes just to tell about the laboratory for the moment I'm working. So uh, we are located like 25 to 30 kilometers away from Paris and it's called uh, Unite Mix de Physique. So basically in English, like a mixed unit of physics research. And it's a joint laboratory between uh, CNRS and the Thales company, which was created in 1995. So we all know that in 1988, there was uh, the discovery of giant magneto resistance by Professor Albert Farr. And since then, there was a active collaboration going on between the Thales company and Professor Albert Farr. And this basically ended up in the creation of this uh, laboratory. And so basically, we have a building for CNRS research inside the big uh, Thales campus. And initially it started just with uh, Albert's uh, team for the spintronics research, but with time it uh, emerged like there are 
many other topics which emerged in the laboratory. And for the moment, very broadly, if I tell, like there are four major research themes in the lab, uh, spintronics, then functional oxides, superconductivity, and neuromorphic computing. So among these, I belong to the oxide uh, group, which is uh, majorly uh, led by Dr. Manuel Vives and Professor Anies Barthelemy. So with this introduction, maybe I would uh, start my talk. So in, in, in today's talk, first, I would like to give a very brief introduction to the conventional oxide to dimensional electron gas. So basically I would uh, give some uh, information related to the LAO-STO 2 dex that's the two dimensional electron gas uh, at the interface of lanthanum aluminate and strontium titanate. And then I will move on to the main, uh, main topic of today's talk, that's the two dimensional electron gas based on potassium tantalate. And then I would talk uh, more about like probing the band structure, doing spin charge interconversion in this two dimensional electron gas, and also uh, finding the superconductivity in this. And time to time for each part, I would like to give a brief uh, summary also. So to begin with, uh, lanthanum aluminate and strontium titanate, they both are uh, white band cap insulators with perovskite structure. And in 2004, by Otomo and Hawang, they, they discovered that if, uh, let's say, five unit cell of lanthanum aluminate is deposited on top of strontium titanate, then although they both are uh, white band cup insulator, as I said, but at the interface, conductivity was discovered. So basically for uh, strontium titanate, the, the planes, they are charge neutral, but in case of lanthanum aluminate, the planes are not charge neutral. So there is a charge reconstruction happening in the structure. And because of this, at the interface between lanthanum aluminate and strontium titanate, a two dimensional electron gas uh, was discovered. And from this TM image, we can see like very nice crystalline uh, structure of uh, five unit cell of LAO on top of STO. And uh, this uh, two dimensional electron gas was found to be very nicely metallic down to low temperature. It shows very high electron mobility. And that this electron gas was later also proved that it's really two dimensional in nature. And this uh, uh, two deg, they, they started showing a lot of exciting properties like high spin orbit coupling, then low temperature superconductivity. And most importantly, all these properties were possible to tune by applying gate voltages. So soon after the discovery of this LAOSTO two dimensional electron gas, many groups started working on it. And not only just uh, with LAOSTO, it was uh, found that with other perovskites like lanthanum van vanadate or lanthanum titanate, it's also possible to have the two dimensional electron gas at the interface between uh, them with STO. But all this growth involves really high temperature PLD growth, and you need to have very good crystalline quality of the substrate, uh, sorry, of the whole stack. So more recently by uh, Rodel et al., they found another possible route to obtain such uh, two decks just by depositing some metal on top of uh, STO at room temperature through the redox uh, reaction. So uh, the criteria to achieve such kind of reduced STO is the work function of the metal has to be lower than that of STO and the enthalpy for formation of metal oxide should be also lower than that of STO. So with this idea, what we did is much simpler stuff is we grew few angstrom of metal by DC sputtering at room temperature. And uh, maintaining this criteria, we chose different metals like tantalum, aluminum, yttrium, gadolinium. And then uh, what happens basically when we deposit such metals on top of STO, they become metal oxide by taking oxygen uh, from the surface of the STO and therefore oxygen vacancies are created at the interface between the metal oxide and the STO. And these oxygen vacancies in turn give rise to the two-dimensional electron gas. 
So after growing these samples, immediately we studied the X-ray photoelectron spectra uh, in situ. And here I am not going into very detail with all the metals because this is just the introduction with uh, sto 2 dex and finally I will talk more about the kto 2 dex which is the topic of today's talk. So um, I am just showing uh, for aluminium and here the, from the XPS spectra you can see like that the inset is uh, showing the XPS for bare STO substrate where there is no deposition and we can see only the peak corresponding to titanium 4 plus is present. This means that it's fully oxidized and no oxygen vacancies are present in the system. But as soon as we deposited four angstrom of aluminum on top of this STO, immediately we could see that a peak corresponding to titanium three plus is getting evolved, telling us that oxygen vacancies are created in the system. And as we increase the thickness of aluminum, the, the intensity of titanium three plus increases as well as titanium two plus uh, also shows up. So as we deposit more aluminum, more and more oxygen vacancies are created. And we can say that the two dimensional electron gas is forming in our samples. So basically with all these metals, we could achieve the two dimensional electron gas with STO. And from the transport uh, measurements, we could see that all our samples are very nicely metallic uh, down to very low temperature, that's two Kelvin. So if you are interested to know more about this kind of uh, uh, structures, then you can follow these two articles. Here you will get all the details related to this. But uh, if we now, like, because I just said that uh, this kind of two-dimensional electron gas also show very high, uh, very high spin orbit coupling. So the, the thing which is playing uh, a major role behind this is the Rajba effect. So which is the manifestation of spin orbit interaction in solids, more particularly in case of the two dimensional electron system, uh, because there the spin degeneracy is lifted by a symmetry breaking uh, electric field. So basically this is the expression for the Rajba Hamiltonian, where this is the Rajba coefficient and uh, the spin and momentum are always locked as they are perpendicular to each other. Now, if we consider a system uh, where there is no Rajba effect present, so a normal spin degenerate system, then the, the bands should look like this. And now in this kind of system, if we add in the Hamiltonian, the Rajba uh, term, then what happens that the spin degeneracy gets lifted and the bands get splitted in the case space like this. So in this kind of system, if I try to get a cross section for a specific energy, so basically I, if I try to see how the Fermi contours look, then it should look like this. So two concentric Fermi contours with opposite chirality where the spin and momentum are always perpendicular to each other. So in this kind of system, if I apply a uh, charge current, let's say in X direction. Then the Fermi contours will shift like this and there will be spin accumulations. And from here you can clearly see that the spin accumulation for up spin and down spin are not equal in quantity. So they cannot fully compensate each other. So finally, we will end up with a finite spin density, which can also be passed through uh, adjacent layer. So basically by doing this, we can do a charge to spin conversion. And this is known as the direct Edelstein effect. And the reciprocal effect for this is known as the inverse Edelstein effect. And for this in the similar, uh, similar samples, instead of passing a charge current, now we uh, inject a spin density, let's say by spin pumping. In, that case, the Fermi contours will shift in opposite direction and uh, then there will be a charge current generated. So, in, so this means like the systems having this kind of Rajba, Rajba contours are basically very nice for such kind of spin charge interconversion. And one very important figure of merit I would like to mention here is the is the figure of merit for spin to charge conversion. That's the ratio between the charge current and the spin current, 
and this is proportional to two things one is the rashba coefficient and uh, another is the momentum relaxation time tau so lambda is proportional to both alpha and tau so as we see that this kind of systems can be really utilized for uh, nice spin charge interconversions so there are like nice application also which can be thought of based on these properties so um, few years back intel proposed a beyond uh, cmos uh, device known as the meso device so the meso stands for magneto electric spin orbit coupling so i i will explain very briefly how this meso device works so the heart of the meso device is a ferromagnet which is shown by this red color uh, red color strip and the writing part for this meso device is based on the magnetoelectric effect where uh, this uh, with this blue block i am showing the magneto uh, electric material so if we pass a input current then by the coupling between the ferromagnet and the magnetoelectric material we can switch the ferromagnet so this is the reading uh, sorry the writing part of the device and for the reading part the spin orbit cup uh, the spin orbit effect is utilized so if we have a very high uh, spin orbit coupling material connected uh, to the ferromagnet then by using this spin to charge uh, conversion which i just showed you we can actually uh, read out the information of the ferromagnet and by changing the direction of the input current basically we can switch the direction of the output current as well as the magnetization direction so we have been working with the intel group in realizing uh, the readout part of this device where we have used uh, the 2d electron gas as a spin orbit material so basically what we were trying is we were trying to find a, a material with which we can have have really efficient spin to charge conversion and for this 2d electron gas are are really promising so for this uh, meso device there are many many uh, potentials like they are memory and uh, logic performed by one device so basically it's in in memory logic that that helps a lot in reducing the energy consumption and this is uh, scalable and also uh, it's low power that's like they predicted that it should be 30 times less than the cmos of the same size but along with the good part there are some technological challenges also so this requires like optimization of materials and interfaces a lot and the most challenging part of this is we need to achieve 100 millivolt of operating voltage because the like all these meso devices will be uh, cascaded so connected one with another so basically the output of this device will be the input of the next one so basically the magnetoelectric uh, material needs to switch below 100 millivolt and most importantly with the spin orbit coupling material we must generate higher than 100 millivolt so it's it's really challenging uh, something uh, and and there are many groups who who are working in realization of this so uh, so to do so uh, we along with other groups we tried to do the electrical con control of rashba in lanthanum oxide and uh, strontium titanate uh, uh, two dimensional electron gas and what people found is there is a strong gate dependence of the amplitude and sign of the rashba coefficient and uh, so far like the highest uh, alpha value uh, for a specific gate voltage was found 50 milli electron volt angstrom and then when the spin to charge conversion were studied in aluminum sto two deck because i just showed you that the alpha varies a lot with uh, the gate voltage so a strong gate dependence was also found for the spin to charge conversion with respect to the gate voltage and extremely large conversion efficiency was found for aluminum sto close to 25 nanometer which is uh, much larger than the topological insulators or lanthanum or the leo sto two decks let's say so keeping all this information in mind 
about the conventional STO2 decks, I would uh, like to start uh, talking about the main uh, topic of today's uh, talk, that's the potassium tantalate two decks. So potassium tantalate, they like it has many similar property uh, like STO that bulk ATO can make metallic upon minute electron doping. Also, it shows very uh, high mobilities like 20,000 uh, 20, centimeters square per volt second. But the main difference between the strontium titanate and the potassium tantalate is in strontium titanate, we have titanium, whereas in this case, we have the tantalum. So tantalum is heavier than titanium. And it's expected that the spin orbit coupling in KTO should be larger than the STO. So it's also possible to achieve two-dimensional electron gas by depositing other perovskite materials similar to STO. And it's expected that the Rashba uh, spin orbit coupling in KTO2 decks should be much larger than the STO2 decks. So there were some preliminary reports where they actually tried to find the Rashba coefficient for uh, KTO2 decks and they found it to be 70 milli electron volt angstrom. So already like long back, they found that the, the preliminary calculation for alpha is already higher than what has been achieved maximum for uh, STO2 decks. Because I just showed that for a specific gate voltage, the maximum of STO2 uh, deck is 50 milli electron volt angstrom, whereas uh, there were already reports of 70 milli electron volt angstrom. So it's nice. And with this motivation, we started to uh, work on the potassium tantalate two decks. So we chose aluminum for this because we already uh, checked that using other, uh, other um, metals, the highest conversion efficiency was uh, for aluminum. So this time we just concentrated on aluminum KTO. So in this case also, we grew few angstrom of aluminum by DC sputtering at room temperature on uh, KTO001 substrates. And the aluminum got oxidized by taking oxygen from the KTO surface and thus the oxygen vacancies are created and the two deck was formed. So we also did the in situ XPA study in this case also. So here also in the inset, we can see for uh, the XPA spectra, for the KTO substrate where only the tantalum five plus state is present. So no oxygen vacancies. And as we start growing aluminum on top of this, we can already see the evolution of tantalum four plus uh, state. And as we increase the thickness of aluminum, we could see the tantalum four plus and tantalum two plus states are uh, evolving in the sample by telling that the redox reaction occurred in the sample and there is two deck formation. So all these experiments were done in our, uh, in our deposition system, which is uh, like shown in this photo. So you can see like we have three PLD chambers, two sputtering chambers. Uh, they are in situ connected with the XPS measurement, we have a mass chamber, we have a lead, everything connected in situ and we can transfer them uh, using this transfer tunnel. So uh, we used uh, the sputtering to grow the samples and then we measured in situ using the XPS technique. So then we also studied the transport pro properties of these samples and uh, you can see that the Samples are very nicely metallic down to low temperature. And also we calculated the carrier density as well as the mobility of these samples from the hall measurements. So uh, here I would like to tell you that the mobility, what we achieved for the aluminum KTO2 decks are of similar order of magnitude what we were achieving for the STO2 decks also. So as I said, it's a comparatively newer system. So we really wanted to, um, to study the band structure of this two deck in very detail. So for this, we used the angle resolved photoelectron spectroscopy. And uh, using this technique, basically we can map the band structure of uh, a material. Basically, if you have a sample and if you shine the sample surface with a VUV uh, light or let's say soft X-rays, 
then uh, the due to the photoelectric effect the electrons from the uh, from the sample will uh, be scattered and when they come out basically using this hemispherical analyzer you can simultaneously probe the kinetic energy as well as the momentum of this photo emitted electrons and the band structure can be constructed by measuring the kinetic energy and the emission angle of these electrons with respect to the surface normal of the sample. So basically the, the, the emission angles will give you the information related to the momentum space and we simultaneously can measure the energy also. So we did all our RPS measurements in the Cassiope beamline in uh, Sole Synchrotron in France. So this is the RPS setup in the Cassiope beamline where this is uh, the, the RPS chamber and here we have the hemispherical analyzer and the light beam comes from here. And in this setup, we have one advantage that is it is in situ connected with one MB chamber. So as I said, like this is a surface sensitive technique. So we cannot really grow thick sample and bring it there, then we will not see any signal. So it's really good if we can uh, prepare our sample here and immediately in situ transfer it to the RPS chamber and study the band structure. So this is what we did. And we, uh, we did measurements for different photon energies as well as different polarizations because by symmetry for the LV photons, they excite the dxy and dyz orbitals and the lh photons they excite the dxz orbitals so to have a, a full overview of all the orbitals uh, present in the band structure of kto we tried different polarization and the energy and angular resolutions were 15 mev and less than 0.25 degrees so uh, as I said, we grew one or two angstrom of aluminum by uh, MB on KTO001 and transferred in situ in the RPS chamber. And from the RPS measurement, we found this band structure where we can see that the conduction bands of KTO com comprises uh, multiple bands. Now to understand this band structure, we collaborated with a group of Ingrid Martik in uh, Germany who performed that tight binding calculations uh, for this uh, RPS data. And from here, we can see that the band structure uh, comprises four pairs of bands where this uh, pink and the green band, they are having DXY characteristics, whereas the heavy, heavily Rajba splitted band, which is the orange band pair, this, uh, this shows dxz yz characteristics so we wanted to really like we really wanted to know mostly about the this this band structure so we zoomed here like we did more measurements and uh, from here you can clearly see that we could uh, resolute the rush bus splitting of the band in our two dimensional electron gas and this is the first time anyone could uh, see the Rashba splitted bands in any perovskite material. So it was really nice to do this. So, and it was, and, and from the tight binding fitting, we could see that this orange band pair exhibits really ra large Rashba splitting with a Rashba coefficient of 320 milli electron volt angstrom. And this is really one order higher in magnitude than the STO2dex. So this is really nice. And of course we wanted to measure it experimentally. So to do so, we took advantage of the direct Edelstein effect. That's the charge to spin conversion. And in our sample, we pass a charge current. So due to the direct Edelstein effect, a, a spin density got generated perpendicular to the charge current direction. And now if we rotate our sample in plane with respect to the magnetic field direction, then the resistivity equation should look like this, where there should be two theta dependent terms. The first one is known as bilinear magnetoresistance and this varies as sine theta, whereas the second term varies as cos two theta and it's known as the quadratic magnetoresistance term. If we try to look uh, at the coefficient of these two terms, then uh, 
the coefficient of BMR varies linearly with the current density as well as the magnetic field and the coefficient of QMR varies quadratically with respect to the magnetic field. So we uh, did this measurement on our sample and we found that for BMR it really varies as sine theta and for QMR it varies as cos to theta and the coefficient of uh, BMR varies linearly with current density as well as magnetic field and the coefficient of QMR varies quadratically with magnetic field. So far so good. And here you can see that uh, in the coefficient of B BMR, there is the Rajba coefficient. So if we take a ratio between these two coefficients, then we can estimate the value of Rajba coefficient from these measurements. So we estimated that the value of Rajba coefficient is between 70 to 280 milli electron volt angstrom. And this is a real good agreement with the theoretical calculation. So we know that in our sample, we have really high uh, Rajba, uh, Rajba spin orbit coupling present. So of course we wanted to study the reciprocal effect, that's the spin to charge conversion. And uh, for spin to charge conversion, we need to inject a spin current. And to do so, we took advantage of spin pumping measurements. So we deposited uh, like 20 nanometer of parmaloy layer on top of the aluminum oxide. And then uh, we performed uh, FMR measurements. So basically at the resonance, a spin current uh, from the parmaloy got injected in that uh, two day layer. And due to the inverse Edelstein effect, a charge current got generated perpendicular to the spin current direction. And then we could measure this uh, the corresponding voltage uh, due to this charge current. And when we did this, we found really nice symmetric, uh, uh, symmetric signal exactly appearing at the magnetic resonance. And as we uh, change the polarity of the magnetic field, we can see that the sign of this charge current also is getting changed. So this is also something we wanted uh, for the MISO device, so it's really nice. And then we estimated the, the lambda for this, we got it to be three to four nanometer, that is similar order of STO2 dex. So we know that we have really high Rajba spin orbit coupling in our samples, but finally we are not gaining in the lambda. So here I would like to uh, bring your notice that the lambda uh, depends not only on alpha, but also on tau. And tau depends on two things. One, the mobility of the samples, and next is the effective mass of the electrons. So in case of STO2 dex, the effective mass is like one, two, two, two. But in case of KTO, it is like one order of magnitude lower. So although we gained one order of magnitude in alpha, but finally we lost the similar amount with the tau. And finally we end up with similar order of magnitude of uh, lambda in case of KTO 2 dex. Now the effective mass is a material property and we cannot change it. But what we can change is the mobility of our sample. I, I mentioned that in our samples, we got similar mobility for the STO 2 dex and KTO 2 dex. So as future perspective, I would like to mention that we need to grow samples with much higher mobility so that we can, uh, we can really take advantage of this one order of magnitude high uh, Rajba uh, spin orbit coupling to gain, like, uh, to gain a lot in the lambda. So, so far I was talking about the spin Edelstein effect and the experiment, like what we got from the experiment. Now, if we try to understand from the theoretical point of view, like what is happening in the spin Edelstein effect, as well as the orbital Edelstein effect, then, so from here, I would like to present you few, few slides where we did uh, some theoretical calculation in collaboration with the group of Ingrid Marty. So here I came back with the, with the band structure I already showed you for RPS measurement and the tight binding fits. And uh, from here, basically what we did is calculated the spin and orbital textures for each band pair at selected ISO energy lines. So very close to the um, pink band edge, we see 
that the Fermicone tubes are very, very nicely standard Rajba like with the spin and orbital moments pointing opposite to each other. So here I would like to define a nomenclature for all the images because here in this image, let's say the top part contains information about spin, the bottom part contains information about orbital, the right part contains information about the inner bands and the left part contains information about outer bands. And this kind of nomenclature I am going to use for every isoenergy lines. So here at very low energy, we can only see one band is present and it's very nicely uh, standard Rajba. Then as we increase the energy close to the uh, green, uh, uh, close to the band edge of the green pair of band. This is also similar. It uh, shows uh, similar Rajba like uh, texture. And uh, the, the alpha R was calculated to be 10 milli electron volt angstrom for these two band pair. Now, of course, we want to know more about uh, this uh, band pair because here we see the large Rajba splitting. So as we move towards this band edge, we can see that this, this part is the zoom uh, version of the, of the orange band pair. So here we can see that the spin and orbital textures completely deviate from the standard Rajva model due to very high orbital mixture between the DXZ and DYZ uh, characteristics. So basically what we found from the theoretical calculation that the sign for DXZ and DYZ are uh, opposite to each other. And because it's a isotropic uh, structure, so it's like 50%, 50% mixture of DXZ, DYZ characters. So basically they are canceling each other. So there is a huge uh, compensation effect and the, the length of the spins here are basically um, telling you about the spin expectation values. So in this case, for the, the highly uh, Rajba splitted bands, we can see that the spin expectation values are really small. So this also indicates that the spin Edelstein effect should not be very large from this kind of uh, samples. And as we move further to higher energy, we can see that, that the model completely deviates from the standard Rajba model and like very high uh, hybridization starts appearing in the band structure and we start seeing like instead of a two pi rotation of spins in the uh, full contour we start uh, seeing like six pi or ten pi rotation so everything got much more complicated and in this scenario we calculated uh, the spin as well as the orbital edelstein effects theoretically and the top graph shows the spin Edelstein effect where we can see that the sign of the Edelstein effect can be positive or negative depending on the, on the corresponding momentum value. So basically, initially, like for the lower energy, it mostly followed the Edelstein effect coming from the pink band pair. So this is with the dxy orbital characteristics. And then when the, or, the orange band pairs start showing up, it showed a negative uh, sign in compared to the pink band uh, pair. So this means another compensation effect. So this means that the sign for the DXY and the DXZYZ are again opposite to each other. So there is a strong compensation effect in the total Edelstein effect happening here, which we can see because of these uh, opposite signs. And when we calculated the orbital Edelstein effect, one very good thing we observed that the orbital Edelstein effect is 10 times larger than the spin Edelstein effect. And so far experimentally, we could uh, measure only the spin Edelstein effect. We have never measured the orbital Edelstein effect. So this means that if somehow we can uh, include the orbital Edelstein effect also in the measurements, this will give us much higher spin to charge uh, conversion. And the orbital Edelstein effect uh, shows that they are, they are larger than the spin moments. And 
also they are uh, the sign of the orbital edelstein effect is opposite to the spin edelstein effect so when we plotted the total of spin plus orbital edelstein effect there is also another compensation effect coming due to this but despite all this compensation effect still the spin edelstein effect with ketio is larger than the spin edelstein effect in sto by a factor of 2 and orbital edelstein effect in ketio is larger by a factor of 4 uh, in comparison to the sto 2 dex so i would like to give a brief summary of this part because from like from these uh, theoretical calculations we uh, saw that although our system uh, shows very large uh, rajva spin orbit coupling but still there are some compensation effects playing very important uh, role Uh, in the spin charge interconversion efficiency so the compensation effects are mostly threefold the first one is the edelstein effect coming from the dxz yz so this band pair is weaker due to the opposite spin texture of dxz and yz components so the ketio is cubic so this means it's isotropic in nature but maybe we predict that we can solve this problem by introducing some in plane anisotropy so that it's not any more 50% 50% of dxz yz and then we can really uh, like get very high spin to like spin edelstein effect from uh, this band pair the next compensation effect arises due to the opposite sign of the xy bands and the dxz yz bands so for this what we can do we can generate two dimensional electron gas uh, in some materials where the crystal uh, field splitting will be exactly opposite so where basically the dxz yz band will lie below the dxy band if we can design some two deck like this we we can we can have both similar signs so we can get rid of this compensation effect and the last one is we found that the spin edelstein and the orbital edelstein generally having opposite signs so we have to choose some material to um, generate the two deck where the spin and orbital moment should be parallel so we have to choose something with more than half field orbitals basically so with this i come to the last part of my talk which is the like the superconductivity in ketio 2 dex so uh, people try to achieve the superconductivity in ketio since really long ago the paper now i am showing you is like from 1982 but they could never achieve it they like in this paper they are telling that they tried really from 0.01 to 4 kelvin and there was no evidence of superconductivity found in ketio but very recently like last year a group by anand bhattacharya in us they showed that although it's still not possible to achieve superconductivity with ketio 001 but it's possible to achieve superconductivity with ketio 111 direction and they found the superconducting tc for this uh, samples 2 kelvin which is again one order of higher in magnitude than the sto2 dex because the sto2 dex shows superconductivity close to 25 milli kelvin whereas this is 2 kelvin so this is a really good news and like more or less simultaneously there was another report uh, came out which told that for ketio 110 direction also it's superconducting but with a comparatively lower tc that's 1 kelvin so so far there is no superconductivity reported with ketio 001 but uh, superconductivity was found for ketio 110 and 111 directions and for both these direction the superconducting tc is one order of magnitude higher than the sto2 dex so what we tried is again uh, the same technique of growing aluminum using dc sputtering on ketio 111 this time and when we did the in situ xps again we found that okay before depositing anything the for the ketio 111 uh, substrate it's showing only tantalum 5 plus state but as we start depositing uh, aluminum on top of this we could get 
uh, that tantalum 4 plus and tantalum 2 plus, this means that oxygen vacancies are created. Now, because this time we are talking about superconductivity, so we have to be very careful because aluminium is also superconducting. So we have to really check that the, in case we get superconductivity, it is not coming due to aluminium, it's really coming from the KTO2 deck. So we really checked uh, using XPS that the aluminium is 100% oxidized. So there is no metallic aluminium left. And uh, then uh, we also studied the cross-sectional TM of the sample. And from here, we can see that aluminium does not get interdiffused in, uh, inside the substrate. So quite sharp interface. And then when we did the transport measurement, we could see that in our sample also we found superconductivity and the superconducting TC can also be tuned by varying the growth parameters of the samples. And uh, the scaling for the superconducting TC with respect to the carrier density matches very well with the one reported by Liu et al, which is the first paper uh, related to KTO111 superconductivity. And then we studied uh, the critical field associated to the superconductivity. And from there, uh, by fitting this data using a landau ginzburg equation, we calculated the coherence length, which came out to be 24 nanometer. That's similar order of magnitude as found by uh, Liu et al. Further, we tried to achieve the gate voltage tunability of the superconducting TC. And we found that uh, below minus 25 volt, where there is like really less number of carriers are present in the sample, there it shows disordered superconductivity. It's because like there are like clusters uh, where uh, the superconductivity are present, but it's so less carrier density, like the clusters are basically not talking between each other. So finally, we don't achieve the final superconducting state. But as we increase the gate voltage, so we are doping with more and more carriers, then these, uh, these clusters start talking to each other and they become more homogeneous and we could achieve the final superconducting state. So with the gate voltage tunability, we could show that it's possible to switch on and off the superconductivity with the gate voltage. And finally, we did the superfluid st stiffness measurement in our sample, where the superfluid uh, stiffness is uh, the energy associated to the phase rigidity of the superconducting condensate. So by measuring this, basically we can get many information uh, like the nature of the superconduct, uh, the nature of the superconductivity, then the superconducting gap, a lot of things, and. For to do this, what we did is uh, we put our sample in a parallel RLC circuit and then we put this thing inside a microwave cavity. So in this circuit, the capacitance is uh, largely influenced by the capacitance of KTO because, it's, because the permittivity of KTO is really high. And then we have this inductance. Now at the normal state, the, uh, we, we just have contribution from this inductance. But at the superconducting uh, state, we have one extra contribution in the inductance, that's a kinetic inductance of the two day. So basically when we measure uh, it at the normal state, we find this resonance. And when we measure it at the superconducting uh, state, due to the appearance of this extra uh, kinetic inductance, there is a shift in the uh, resonance frequency in the higher frequency side. And also there is a phase shift. So from this, we can calculate this uh, kinetic inductance of the two deg and finally calculate the superfluid stiffness. So this is what we did and the, the blue circles show the experimental data for the superfluid stiffness. And uh, we try to understand this result and fit this data in collaboration with uh, Lara Benfetto from Italy. And basically what we found that in case of STO2 decks, where it was very easily possible to fit with uh, the standard BCS theory, it was not possible in case of uh, KTO2 deck. So this uh, purple line shows the BCS fits, which you can see clearly not at all matching with our experimental data. And for this, what she had to do is to fit with another equation, that's the BKT fit. 
and uh, this the red line shows the BKT feed. So this means like we have really 2D uh, like 2D nature of superconductivity in our sample, and uh, the flattening of this curve below one Kelvin also tells that we have fully gapped behavior with uh, dominated by S wave component in our uh, system. So this is something new because in case of standard STO2 days, uh, it was always governed by the BCS theory, whereas it was not possible for uh, the KTO2 days. But I must say that this is really the beginning and we still really do not know, like it's not at all clear to us uh, the, the origin of the superconductivity in KTO111 and 110, but nothing in, one, uh, in 001. So, many more experiments has to be done to understand the origin of the superconductivity and also to calculate let's say the superconducting gap and and the nature of the superconductivity with this i would like to summarize my talk by telling that i think i could uh, convince you that ktu 2 decks are really promising systems to study the spin to charge interconversion and superconductivity so in our case, with a very simple technique sputtering, we could uh, fabricate the KTO2 decks. Then we could also probe the band structure using RPS, which was the first time observation of uh, Rajba splitted uh, bands. And then we experimentally uh, calculate the, the Rajba coefficient, which is one order higher in magnitude than the STO2 decks. Also, theoretically, we predict that if we can use the orbital Edelstein effect, it's like 10 times stronger than the spin Edelstein effect. Also, with KTO1112 deck, we could get uh, very high superconducting TC in compared to STO2 decks. And we could also prove the 2D nature of superconductivity from the BKT type transition. But as I said, a lot to do more in future. So we have to fabricate a higher mobility KTO2 decks and then we can really achieve very high spin to charge con uh, conversion which will be really appealing for the uh, beyond CMOS future spintronic technology and in case experimentally we can utilize the orbital Edelstein effect it will be super nice something and the discovery of superconductivity in KTO2 decks adds another degree of freedom towards the realization of topological electronics. So with this, I would like to thank all my co-workers without whose help it was never possible to uh, achieve any of these uh, results. And uh, thank you all for your uh, kind attention. All right, Sijani, wonderful presentation. I really thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you so much on behalf of everyone. So now I would request you to stop sharing and request all of you to switch on your camera so that we can quickly make a group photo and then we will have some question answer. Oh, good to see you all friend. Hello. Yeah, so, uh, yes. Puspendra, you can also take some uh, screenshots. I'm taking two. Okay, guys. Cheers. Ah, good to see you, Manuel. Hi. Okay, one more time. Say cheese. Very good. So I think uh, you may kindly stop your videos and uh, we can have some question answer you can again share your screen Sijani. okay so i just tell that if uh, you have a question and you want to you want me to read it and kindly write in the chat box otherwise uh, just raise hands and i will go one by one so is there a question not yet uh, uh, well uh, let me just uh, i mean start with a very uh, simple question I'm not an expert. Uh, so uh, I understand the superconductivity, uh, what you have shown towards the uh, last part of your talk mm -hmm. is happening at the interface. So yes. how do you measure? Because the top uh, KTO is still no superconductivity. So how do you measure oh, this? Well, uh, KTO, uh, KTO is in bottom 
because KTO is the substrate mm. and top of the KTO, I am growing the aluminum oxide, yeah. but aluminum oxide is also insulating. So yeah. whatever conductivity we have is just from the two deck. So like if we, when we are bonding the sample, if we punch through the aluminum oxide, then yeah. we are measuring everything. We are measuring the KTO aluminum oxide and two decks simultaneously. But okay, as sure. the aluminum oxide and KQ are insulating, so we we just have the information from today. So it is like run in a port probe or Van der Poe method on, on port the surface? Probe, uh, Van der Poe, yes. Okay. yes. Yeah, that's very Excuse nice. me, can I ask the question? Yeah, please, please. Uh, I, I am uh, not an expert in the field, but uh, it's very interesting that your superconductivity in KQ is so anisotropic. At the same time, you were trying to, I mean, at least I understand you use BCS theory. Uh, could you give some hint what should be the reason of such a huge anisotropy in a cubic crystal, which is actually inherently not anisotropic? Why there is so much of anisotropy with respect to direction? Uh, no, actually, the thing is, KTO001 is cubic, but if we consider the KTO111, then, then it becomes hexagonal. So there is actually anisotropy in the in inherently in KTO one one one, and in principle for KTO zero zero one, nobody could achieve superconductivity so far. So as you said, like for sure there is a very huge contribution of anisotropy in the in the superconductivity, like the origin of superconductivity, but we really do not know the exact reason of the of the superconductivity but it's uh, very much anisotropic in nature and when we measure let's say at different anisotropy directions we also get different tcs another uh, question maybe a little novice as i understand that you are uh, depositing very thin layers of aluminum one or two angstrom so yes. do they form a percolating path? Because after all, you have to measure a very low resistivity in a two-dimensional electron gas, whereas the aluminium, they may be islanding, isn't it? One uh, or two yes, but, but this, yes, exactly. But this one and two angstrom are just for the RPS measurement. When we did the band structure study, there we really need to, because it's just surface sensitive, so we really need to be close to the surface. So we did one or two angstrom with MB, but the samples which I am mostly studying for transport measurement uh, are done by sputtering. And there I am growing like two nanometer. Okay, so just a quick question. The, uh, the KTO is, uh, is the substrate, yeah? Yes, and we are okay. We are using KTO as substrate, but it's also possible to grow KTO by PLD on other yeah. substrates. And then you are growing the aluminum by sputtering. Yes. And uh, of, of course, you are doing in situ XPS, mm -hmm. which confirms this oxygen deficiency. But I just wonder, let's say you will not have oxygen deficiency. Each slide, whenever you talked about the two-deck nature, you explained it. So then is there a way to confirm that it's a two deg or, or you really need XPS to show that there is this oxygen deficiency as a function of tantalum, uh, uh, yeah, to, aluminum thickness. Yeah. To achieve the two deg in this case, because there, there can be many uh, origin of achieving the two deg, but in my case, I am always getting the two deg due to the oxygen vacancies. So if there is no oxygen vacancy in my sample, there is no today. But without doing the XPS also, it's possible. Like if let's say I don't do XPS, I grow my sample and take it out for transport measurement. Just by transport measurement, also I can confirm that I have today in my sample. Yeah. But anyway, like the oxygen vacancies has to be present. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's clear enough. Thank you. Uh, I think there are some questions by Puspendra, Isita, Swayam. So Puspendra, Hello, the very nice talk. Uh, the you have shown some uh, ISHE measurements. So you have used room. Uh, you have you have performed these measurement at room temperature or low temperature? Both. The data here I showed are at fifteen Kelvin, but we also have data at uh, room temperature. Room temperature also you have got the ISHE voltage. 
because the KTO and yes. uh, is it showing associate room temperature also? Uh, okay, and the thing here is of course at room temperature we have much uh, less. Okay, for us it's not ISHG. For us it's the inverse Edelstein effect, which we are measuring. But anyway, it's more or less similar principle. But uh, the the voltage we are getting is uh, less. Like the spin to charge conversion is much less at room temperature in comparison to the low temperature. But as I said in the beginning, like let's say for the Mizu device, the final motive is to have a voltage, and the voltage is the the uh, multiplication of uh, the uh, the charge current as well as the resistance. Now for the two deck, one good point or advantage is at room temperature, the resistance is much higher. So even if we are having a bit uh, less charge current, let's say, when we multiply or when we get the voltage, finally it turns up to be very nice because we have very high res uh, resistance of, of the two deck. So finally, it does not matter a lot, I would say, for, our, for us. Okay, thank you. Dick. Because we are mostly interested in the final voltage. Yeah. Yes. Okay, Isita, you would like to unmute and ask your question? Uh, hello, Sri Janidhi. Uh, thanks for such mm -hmm. a nice talk. So, uh, in the introduction part, you told that uh, the uh, two-dimensional electron gas in which you are working, that will have uh, applications in the writing part of these Misho devices. Uh, reading. So, uh, sorry? Reading part. Sorry, yeah, reading part. So, they are like... Uh, they have a uh, today gas, they have a uh, very high uh, spin orbit coupling, raster spin orbit coupling. But the yes. thing is, there are like other materials also, which also have a uh, similar raster spin orbit coupling. And uh, like, can you compare like how the spin orbit coupling strength for two deck are uh, like uh, with comparison of graphene or two dimensional charcoalogenides? Yeah, so basically, you know, for this, as I told, like for the MISO, there are different teams working on, on this topic. And of course, I know that the graphene and uh, the, the 2D chalcogenides, they, they also show very high spin orbit coupling. But uh, the so far, the highest with aluminum STO, what we got, the spin to charge conversion, is uh, still much larger than what they achieved. Okay. So in terms of spin to charge, charge conversion efficiency, this yes. is much promising. Yes, yes. Uh, I have another question like uh, from the RPS measurement, uh, yes. you told in one slide that uh, the DXY and DXZ bands have opposite spin texture. So like what does that mean actually? The sign, the... Uh, you mean yes? I said like uh, with the uh, the the sign of the spin texture for dxy uh, orbital and the sign of the spin texture for uh, for the dxz yz orbital, they are opposite. So basically, if let's say I have a Fermi contour, okay, let's let's consider this. Like if if I have a Fermi contours and if the chirality is like this for dxy then for dxz yz the chirality will be opposite the okay, spin okay. yes okay thank you okay isita thank you so um, uh, should i read it or you will ask uh, she is telling to read okay so what are the other structures that are promising for such behavior for two day and superconductivity nature other structures like other uh, perovskites or yes there there are many actually perovskites initially it started with laosto and then as i said like there are other like lanthanum vanadate lanthanum titanate actually many also there are let's say uh, zirconates which can be also promising then Many, many can actually accommodate the two dimensional electron gas. Okay, all right. Uh, is there any other question by anybody? 
Uh, if not, then I think it's time. Uh, uh, really nice talk. Uh, we enjoyed the discussions. So Sijani, could you please stop sharing? I like to share my screen to present you a small memento. Uh, do you see my screen? Do you see my screen? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. So I will read it for you. W2S seminar webinar series on Spintronics, National Institute of Science Education and Research, Nysar Bhubneswar, that's your alma mater. Takes pleasure in presenting this plaque to Dr. Sijoni Molik from CNRS Thales, uh, University of Paris Saclay in France. In a cognition and appreciation for being a valuable speaker to give a lecture on potassium tantalate, two dimensional electron gas, a new playground for spin charge, interconversion, and superconductivity. Wonderful. So on behalf of everyone, thank you very much. I like to thank you again for this nice talk. Keep doing good work and make nicer proud, and uh, all the best. And thank you all guys for joining. We will meet uh, next week, 4 p.m. Please note, next week would be our hundredth uh, seminar. That's really something to cheer up. And today I was very happy to see Professor Albert Ford in the audience, but just before the photo session, he left. Uh, he's a regular visitor to our uh, seminar program, so it's very nice to have him. Uh, but next week we will have uh, an, uh, Professor Albert Ford give the 50th seminar, and we have the next uh, is 100th, which will be given by Professor Stuart Parkin. So please join next week 4 p.m. We will send notifications about it in very short time. Thank you, Sujani. Have a nice day. Thank you. And uh, see you later. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you.